What up, what up? Here we are with another episode of the Who's Where podcast. I'm your host, Chase Minifield, coming to you live. We in D.C. with it. Uh, Max, what's good? What's going on, world? You see, you know what I'm saying? New venue. Again, here we are, D.C. Trying something new, so glad to have you guys back. We got one of our uh, classmates uh, in the building today. Class of 2011, Toria Edmonds Howe. How are you doing, Toria? I'm good. How are you all? Good. We're doing well. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for um, me. So I always like to start off like, what made you want to come to UVA? What was the thing that that uh, made you decide UVA was my path? Uh, so UVA was a last minute decision for me. Um, in high school, I was one of those kids who like applied to every college. I was really like driven. I knew that I wanted to go to a school that was like, you know, well ranked and had some prestige. And so I had applied to. Duke and UNC Chapel Hill and like Spelman and NYU and all these different schools and when it came time to like really make a decision sat down with my parents and like had the money conversation of like what can we afford what makes the most (laughs) sense Um, and I had gotten a full ride to the University of Richmond and so in some ways that was like the no brainer. Yeah, like my family Richmond. was like, yeah, that's where you're <laughs> going. And yeah. so I had committed to going to U of R, but um, I had some peers, some classmates from my high school who did go off to UVA. And so they invited me up for spring fling. Oh, I yeah. went and I came home after that weekend. And it was like, yeah, I <laughs> need to go to UVA. This is where I want to be. So. Um, after that experience, I decided I want to go to UVA. I can see myself spending the next four years here. So mm-hmm. decided that's, that's where what's I'm up. going. And you're from Richmond, right? So that's, yeah. that's kind of tough to turn down the home, the, the home in tour. city, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. School. Yeah. But I think good in the sense that like I got away from Richmond for a while, yeah. which yeah. was nice. I can't do it. I, w- I would have never went to, I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. I would have never went to University of Kentucky. Couldn't be that close. No, 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 no. Not yeah. at all. I would at least went an hour away at least. Yeah. yeah. So, um, no, that's dope. So, essentially, uh, who was the people that were responsible for recruiting you here to the University of Virginia? I guess we got to thank them for getting so, a, an established alumni. there are a number of people, but um, I don't know if you know Jaleesa Anderson. She went yeah. to high school with me. So, she was um, in the engineering school. I stayed with her, kind of got to meet all of her friends. They showed me the ropes. Then I met a lot of like prospective students and yeah. just built bonds. So yeah. after that, it was like history. Were we were we there for Spring Fling the year before we got there? No. Did they not have the recruiting visit on that same mm-hmm. weekend? No. Oh, okay. I, didn't, I, I wasn't sure. Um, so essentially, where did you know what you wanted to study? But before we get into that, like tell everybody what you're doing now. What's your current title? What's your current job? So I do a lot of things. Yeah. Um, in kind of the nine to five space, I manage an innovation center for um, a financial institution, so for a bank. Okay. Um, and so in that work, I work with small business owners, entrepreneurs, startup founders to really kind of bring the bank's resources to bear to support them. So that mm. looks like, you know, philanthropic support through funding, you know, different grants and pitch competitions. It includes like, getting associates from the business to volunteer and do pro bono work for those startups and then just kind of creating space for them. So that's what I do in nine to five space. I'm yep. also a small business owner, which is a path is that, a that conflict? Is that a conflict of interest? Do you, do you, so, do you find yourself? <laughs> no, so it's funny you bring that up because I am constantly in a space of like navigating and making yeah. sure that I'm not falling into um, conflicts of interest. So I'm very mindful about that, but you know, just being in that space, like I had never seen entrepreneurship kind of on the roadmap for me, but I had always kind of existed as an entrepreneur. So mm. within companies, institutions, corporations, always kind of task or finding myself in roles where I was standing up new things, solving problems, kind of having that entrepreneurial mm. spirit or um, attitude, but in like a structured space. And so you know, being around startup founders and seeing all the amazing things they were doing, the problems that they were solving, like, I got the itch and was yeah, like, yeah. I, I want to do this It's thing. time. It's yeah. time. That's what's up. Um, so then running it back a little bit, um, what did you study at UVA that, or what did you want to study at UVA and did it change once it, you got there? It changed. So yeah. 
coming in, I thought psychology. Yeah. And if you ask me why, I don't really know. I think <laughs> psychology just sound like this like prestigious, like fancy thing to study. And so I started off as a psych major, quickly realized it wasn't what I thought it was mm -hmm. going to be. And I just didn't have a lot of interest and passion there. And so I was kind of like trying to find my way. I didn't know what I mm -hmm. wanted to study. So I just started taking a bunch of different classes. I was fortunate to come into um, my first year with quite a few credits. So it gave me some like flexibility to explore and discover. But it wasn't until I think like final hours of second year, I was like, I think I know what I want to do. But I had this kind of pull or tension because I was like, I don't know what job this is going to lead to. Yeah, right. um, I had a lot of interest in English as a major. I've always been a reader and someone who's into literature and words and communication overall. So I was like, okay, I'll major in English, but I don't know what I'm going to do with that yeah. after I graduate. And then I had taken quite a few African American studies courses. And at UVA, that was one of my first times having like professors of color and mm. they were in the AAS major and so I wanted to stick with that because I just enjoyed having that experience so that's where I landed I still was stressing on like what's next yeah. because yeah. whenever I would tell someone I'm an English major they'd be like oh you're going to be a teacher and yeah, I was right, like right. I don't know that I see myself as a teacher um you're going to go to law school that's a possibility but yeah. I'm not sure so yeah. I just kind of like took my classes and was focused on graduating, but really didn't have a sense of like truly what was coming what was next. Yeah. So that makes sense. So you, you did English and African American studies, um, and that was a I guess major in English, minor in African American studies. A double major. Double major. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow. big time. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm struggling with a single major. Yeah, yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Um, so essentially, give us your overall experience. Like, what what did what do you think? Was it a culture shock coming to UVA, or was it kind of similar to how high school was? And then, like, what are some of the things you enjoyed while on campus? Yeah, so I wouldn't say it was a culture shock. I, I tell people all the time, I've, like, my entire life navigated many different worlds. Yeah. So I grew up in Church Hill, and Church Hill neighborhood in Richmond now looks a lot different than it did when I was growing up in the 90s. But um, the neighborhood that I came from is very much one that people would consider, like, you know, a challenging neighborhood. It had, you know, crime and, you know, its issues, but I had a really strong family that, like, you know, just promoted education and, like, well-being and, like, all the things that, you know, most families um, preach. And my parents sent my sisters and I to private school, so mm. I did not go to public school for pretty much the majority of my K-12 um, career. So I went to collegiate, which... Russell Wilson was my yeah, same yeah, year yeah. at Collegiate. So, oh man, you should have recruited uh, him to UVA. <laughs> no, right? Hold on, the story is he wanted to come to UVA. Coach Grow didn't let him. And they didn't sure. want him. And Too the coaches sure. didn't want him. You know anything? You know any insights on that? I don't know any insights, <laughs> but it would have been amazing to have Russell at UVA. He's just an amazing person overall. Yeah. But at that school, it was like a college prep school. I was, you know, there with students who, you know, they just live very different lives than the life that I lived. And so I, from an early age, had to learn how to navigate spaces and be in spaces where maybe I was the only one mm -hmm. or one of just a few. And so when I got to UVA, it wasn't a culture shock. I think what I dealt with the most was like, the assumptions about like, oh, you're a girl from Richmond. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. that's a Richmond girl. Yeah, yeah. I just remember my first year, like everyone was like, oh, you from Richmond. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that like, mean, right? what do you all think Richmonders yeah. are like? So it wasn't a culture shock. I, the experience was good, but when I reflect back, I feel like it just kind of came and went. Like yeah. Reflecting back, I wish that I lived in the moment mm. a bit more. I think I was so focused on like the school aspect of like, okay, doing well, figuring out what I'm going to study and where yeah. this can lead, you know, after graduation that I don't know that I like was super mindful and savored every moment. Because yeah. now when I look back, I'm like, there's so many experiences I wish I had while I was at UVA that yeah. like... I just put on the back burner. Yeah. Gotcha. Did well, you always want to start your own company while you were at school, or is that something that just came no, recent? No, that truly came when, like, 
the world slowed down yeah. for COVID. COVID. Yeah. Um, entrepreneurship wasn't something I was really introduced to prior. Um, you know, I don't come from a family of entrepreneurs. It wasn't a space I was really surrounded by. So it just wasn't on the vision board for me right. at that moment. That makes sense. Um, so essentially, you know, one of the things I always talk about that I missed from Univ University of Virginia was like the networking aspect mm -hmm. and like especially being in business and entrepreneurship as, as you are, like trying to get a hold of like the UVA resources and the people who are alumni of from University of Virginia and what they actually do. Um, Max, he was very good at networking. Like he knew he knew everybody and everybody that was on <laughs> campus. And for me, like if we not if we wasn't cool or if we wasn't you know connected on social, then I really don't know who you are in, in all yeah. aspects of that. So that was one of the things I regretted. Um, did you have a good experience with like networking and getting to meet as many people as possible from you? At I'm UVA? probably more like you than Max. Yeah. I'm like naturally an introvert. I'm very like, I don't know, I wouldn't say shy, but mm -hmm. networking has just always been one of those spaces where I'm like, I, I seek authentic connections. And I always felt like going in a room and like working the room for like something I was hoping to like gain or seek just I don't know, it felt odd for me yeah. to do just based on my character. And so I don't know that I did as much of it while I was at UVA. Immediately after graduation, I actually worked for UVA for two years. Oh, really? Um, so there is a program, the Virginia College Advising Corps, which falls under kind of the National College Advising Corps umbrella. And I, I describe it as like Teach for America for school counselors. So pretty much... Um, the program takes recent college grads through like a summer training institute to prepare them to serve as like full time college advisors mm -hmm. in high needs high schools throughout the nation. And so I decided to do that. Um, I was working for UVA, like on yeah. UVA's payroll, but placed at a high school in Richmond. And so I found myself, you know, in the two years after graduation at UVA a lot. And I felt like at that moment, at like, 21, 22 years old, I was a bit more comfortable with like networking, networking. Um, especially, you know, in your early career, it's like, I need yeah. someone to help me figure yeah. out what's <laughs> next. So I definitely take more, of, I took more advantage of it then than yeah. while in undergrad. That makes sense. And um, is that where you focus? So you went, right after you got done graduating, you went right into that program. Mm -hmm. uh, you was in Richmond, uh, and then you decided to go get your master's, right? Yeah. So, so what made I, you want to decide to do that? I had spent two years serving as a full-time college advisor at a high needs um, high school in Richmond. And at the end of the two years, I remember like the school district looking at some of the data and the improvement in data um, at the school in terms of like the number of students who are going to college, um, mm -hmm. receiving like financial aid and scholarships to fund that. And so like at that moment, I like had done something that people were like, how'd you do this? Yeah. Like, how'd you accomplish that? And so I started to feel like maybe I have like a skill set here that I should continue to um, pursue. So I went to get my master's in education with a focus on ed leadership and policy, mm -hmm. because at that point in time, I was thinking about like, maybe I will work in like central office and kind of do some work around like policy for the district. Mm -hmm. I did not see myself as a teacher, but in my program, one of my advisors encouraged me to get some time in the classroom to have kind of that firsthand lens to some of the challenges and opportunities within public education. So I spent one year in the classroom and it was probably the hardest year of my life. Um, hats off to all of the teachers out there because it is, it is tough work. Um, yeah. So I got the master's and then kind of continued on this path of like ed leadership, um, program development in the like education space. Um, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and you kind of mentioned that, like, everywhere you've kind of been, like, you've kind of been, like, uh, what you got, an entre entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. That's pretty dope. Have you ever taken, like, a um, like a personality test as far as, like, you know, where they see your personality fits as far as, like, corporate structure? Yeah. So I've done, like, Myers-Briggs and, like, um, Strengths Quest. So mm -hmm. my top five, like, strengths are input, intellection, um, command, yeah. which was surprising to me because I don't see myself as like a commanding Commander. person, yeah. but 
um, feedback from all of my teams I've ever worked with is like, when you identify a problem, mm -hmm. you are laser focused yeah. on, getting on getting it, it solved and you're going to bring everyone along to do so. Um, with Myers-Briggs, I'm an INFG, mm. so introvert, like yeah. Yeah, all yeah, the yeah, way yeah. on the far end of the spectrum, um, very much in a nurturing space, feeling, and I guess I hold some judgment sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> no, those are all like great qualities for an entrepreneur, like just from the idea of like you being able to handle long nights, difficult times, not necessarily, you know what I'm saying, self-starter. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like all those different yeah. types of things right there are like perfect qualities for somebody that starts their own business. So now let's get into the business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is you, you decided to start this business and I'll let you tell us a story. Like what made you choose to start this and where did you see a gap to be like, I can create a business here and gain mm -hmm. some, uh, create like a quality business and gain some money and stuff of that nature? Yeah, so... Like I said earlier, never saw it on the vision yeah. board for myself, but I was in a space where I was working with founders and entrepreneurs every day and just really energized by kind of how they were able to exist. Like, you know, I love the work that I do in my nine to five and I have a lot of agency, but there's something to be said about like something that's truly your own that mm -hmm. you can like design from the ground up and so when the pandemic hit life slowed down quite a bit and i felt like for the first time i think in like the entirety of my adulthood i had a moment to like just dream a yeah, little yeah, yeah. um and so i i would say i probably had this idea tucked in the back of my mind but I'd never really done anything with it, but I decided, hey, I have time, space, and opportunity. Like, let's see what happens. I would say when I decided to launch North 24th Home, I didn't necessarily know where it was going to go. I was like, I have these products. I see an opportunity to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. I understand the problem pretty well, so let's just put it out there and see where it goes. And the reception to the brand like was just unexpected. So when I started to get, you know, people who were purchasing and like sharing with other people, I was like, okay, so now I need to be serious about like, what yeah. am I going to do with this? It's, it's not just like a side hustle or a hobby. Like I need to have a vision, a plan, a roadmap. And so, you know, I'm working with entrepreneurs. I, you know, am surrounded by resources, but yeah faced with that conflict of interest. Like yeah. I can't right. like participate in accelerator <laughs> programs that I'm yeah. funding. Yeah. And so I remember it was like maybe three months into the business and I was doing well yeah. um, in terms of sales and just like recognition of the brand. And so I was like, okay, I need to like strengthen my personal business acumen, but I need to find um, a program which, you know, I don't have my hands in in the nine to five space. So mm. I just started researching national accelerator programs. Um, Target is one of the top ones oh, in awesome. kind of the CPG space for, um, you know, product based brands. And so I was like, you know, I'm going to take a chance yeah. and apply. And I applied and got in. That's and awesome. so nice. I went through Target's accelerator. And I think that was like, the moment where I was like, okay, there's really something here mm -hmm. and I'm like really committed to leaning in to take this to the next level. So tell everybody who doesn't know what North 24 Home is. Yeah, so we are a brand of safe, non-toxic household cleaning products. So most people are like, hmm, <laughs> cleaning products. Like yeah, yeah. how do you come to decide that's what you're gonna do? And like the quick end of the story, so my mom in I think my 10th grade year was diagnosed with kidney disease. And um, I remember at that moment in time, like she was, you know, placed on a donor list. She was waiting for a transplant, but my family had to take some like, you know, drastic changes and shifts in like the products we were using, mm -hmm. the foods that we were eating. And I remember there was a product that we were using in our home and on the back label, it said like, consult with your doctor if you have kidney disease. And I remember just getting super curious about yeah. like, what's in this product that like, 
if yeah. you have kidney disease, like you should yeah, stay yeah, away yeah. from. Yeah. And what, so, what is it though? Like, what is the stuff? You there's don't know? so much junk and so many of you these need to educate. We need there. education. Yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? So, like, we're out here using like, the wrong stuff. Yeah. At that point, I got just really like just super curious about yeah. ingredients and like. I got a bit more mindful about like what I was putting in my body, on my body, like yeah. in my space. And so I had started kind of just happenstance making my own products. I remember like Bath and Body Works was really popular. Every yeah. girl would go out and buy like the candles and the yeah. body lotions. And I remember I couldn't use that stuff yeah. because I would always get a headache. And I'd be like, what is it about these oh, wow. products that's like causing, just causing yeah. me to feel ill? And so... Um, I just kind of been in a space where I was making things for myself, but not even thinking about it as a potential business. It was just solving mm. like a need that I had and um, decided when I, you know, had space and opportunity to start my business that that made sense. Like, you know, one of the things, especially in my work with entrepreneurs that I always, you know, preach is like identify a problem where there's like obviously market opportunity, mm -hmm. but that's not saturated to the point that you're going to like have to fight like crazy to even like make an impact. Yeah. And so I remember like when all the COVID businesses were standing up, so many peers were like going to like the beauty space, which is exciting. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, there's a lot of support and energy in that, in that industry. But I was like, where is no one like really innovating, yeah. no one leaning into like, that's where I want to be. And so cleaning products, mm -hmm. while not sexy, um, when it rolls off the tongue, that was like the space I wanted to lean into. And I did a lot of market research. Um, you know, I remember coming across a Mintel report that cited that black consumers over index in household cleaning essential spending. And so when I first stood up my brand, like, the idea was for me to target black families, mm -hmm. create like a, you know, safe, non-toxic product mm -hmm. that could support them in caring for their homes and their well-being. And that was really exciting to re read that, like, we're over buying other demographics when it comes to household cleaning products. But then I really started to, like, dig a little deeper. And I saw that, like, we were also over indexing in a lot of the health issues mm -hmm. that are associated with, like, the toxins that are in a lot of those products so like the bleaches of the world comet yeah. pine saw all the things that like you grew up yeah. using yeah. Yeah. and mixing together not even realizing what like you're doing. the toxic right. like chemical reaction <laughs> right? and Concoctions. so like that's when i really like honed in like okay i know exactly what it is that i want to do with this brand and where i want to take it so you're up and running sales all that mm -hmm. where does your product kind of stack in sales with uh you know the typical big name brands because oh. you know we know it's <laughs> one of the big <laughs> things is that like you know the safer cleaner products they're usually a bit more expensive so that's why people yeah. shy away from them so yeah where, so where are you kind of stack i am with not competing with the procter and gamble <laughs> okay. of the world right, right now right, they're right, like right. conglomerate yeah yeah yeah, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. The key word yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. so you know, I'm doing really well. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a very loyal customer base. Mm -hmm. um, I think what has been interesting is like I am changing behaviors or mm -hmm. seeking to change behaviors mm -hmm. in a number of ways. So with my target customer, many of them are loyal to the legacy brands right. that we know and many love. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I remember when I first um, kind of started and... Um, I had folks in my family who was like, yeah, I'm going to use your product, but I'm going to follow up with some yeah, bleach. Yeah. It was like, just like <laughs> wedded to this idea that those are the only products yeah. that can clean and clean effectively. Yeah. And so like I'm working to change behaviors as it relates to just understanding of like yeah. what truly, what you truly need in a product in yeah. order to clean, but also changing behaviors like, I'm currently only D to C, so yeah. I have the website. That's where the products are available. Um, and most people don't do their household. direct to consumer. Yeah, yeah. direct to consumer. Yeah, yeah. Most people don't have their household. They don't do their household cleaning product purchases online. online. No. They're yeah. walking into a Target, right. a Walmart, their local grocery store to buy those products. So I'm also seeking to change that yeah. behavior yeah. in some ways. Um, but... All things considered, doing very well. Um, you know, we 
spent the greater part of last year really working to just build out our capabilities so that when we're ready to make the transition to mass retail, mm -hmm. live on shelves, we have everything in place to do so. So like working with a chemist to reformulate all of our products, um, hiring a brand agency to yeah. completely rebrand yeah. um, North 24th, you know, hiring interns. Yeah. I'm surprised that Target, why wouldn't Target put you guys in the shelves from being in your accelerator program? Seems like that would be a part, yeah. like a prerequisite. So we have a really good yeah. working relationship even post-graduation, but one yeah. of the, I think, misconceptions about like entering into mass retail is that like if you have a product, it's ready it's to ready just to be go, placed yeah. you on gotta the be shelf. Certain, like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are certain capabilities, you know, a lot of times for those mass retailers, when they're placing a purchase order, they're placing hundreds of thousands of units. And mm -hmm. so, you know, getting to the point where like you can work with a co-manufacturer and co-packer to do a run of a thousand units of right. one skew like yeah. takes a lot of money yeah. so <laughs> like that's been a really big focus of mine yeah. of i'm not at a space right now where i'm doing like a formal raise but mm -hmm. have focused kind of the last 12 months on going after all of the scholarships grants yeah. um those type of awards doing pitch competitions and have done really well in that um aspect and so gearing up to consider you know raising, raising? so yeah. that i'm in a space to be able to say yes to um a buyer at a target uh, that's what's gotcha. up so um first of all i think it's super dope yeah i think it's a great concept great idea um i've seen some people innovate in the cleaning space like i had a cleaning company not too long ago and um we was losing money. yeah we was losing money max was making us lose money bro but um, oh, man. <laughs> the the different types of products, there's no variation in product options. Yeah. Um, and have you ever thought? I mean, first of all, like speaking of the financing and the funding funding of it, are you still making the product yourself, or you got like a warehouse and type of situation? So I I use a manufacturer to okay. produce it, but I'm packing everything. So okay. me and my small team, we pack everything. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, so you really working around the clock, not around five, the packing. clock, That's around the clock, but you know, the vision's very clear to me. So I'm like, yeah. I'm making this sacrifice yeah. because I know where it can go. Um, so yeah. That's what's up. So yeah. I think there's uh, I mean, this is maybe off ground, but there's also a B2B play in mm -hmm. this as far yeah, as like working so with, um, businesses and colleges and things of that nature from that perspective. You, uh, might want to start start off with collegiate. Make sure you know they should be buying all your, you know, collegiate alum. They need to be yeah, buying all your, uh, buying buy all your, your products stuff. to clean the school. Because I mean, yeah. you're, you're creating a safer product, right? Yeah, and a safer yeah. environment is what they're trying to get done for yeah. sure. But I have seen some innovation in the space. Like there's like this company that has like the little the little pill thing, just dropping yeah. the water yeah. and yeah, stuff like that. that. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, so when was the time when you knew like you had something? I know you said you like once you released it. Like were you nervous? And like, yeah. what, did, you, <laughs> did you have any like market research where you were like, all right, I knew as soon as we get this done, I have some customers ready to go or what was that process? Like? Yeah, I did a lot of market research. So I knew that like pouring resources into starting the brand wasn't like just like foolish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that there was an opportunity there, but with anything like yeah. you still you get anxious out. Yeah, and yeah. nervous of like, how will this be received? Yeah. Like, will people even purchase it? And when I first launched, I remember like I set everything to go live on the website and I was like, I do not want to sit and like monitor this because yeah. I am going to drive myself crazy. So I went to a spin class, you know, did the class, came out, got in my car, checked my phone and I had sold out oh, like oh, wow. all the inventory that I had on hand, which I thought would at While least in spin carry class. me. Yeah. yeah. While in spin class. That's yeah. nice. <laughs> I thought the inventory would carry me through the quarter and it yeah. was gone. Oh. And so that was the moment where I was like, oh, wow. We got like, something here. Yeah. Let's That's keep doing saying. this. So um, while that was great, I will say because I didn't have like a fully fleshed out plan at mm -hmm. that point in time, I found myself in kind of this cycle of like, being reactive because yeah. it was like, okay, well, I've sold through all the inventory that I have. So what do I do until I'm able to like replenish yeah. and yeah. all of those things? So it's been a fun ride, a great journey. Um, I'm excited now more than ever for like what's to come. I think I've had a lot of confirmation over the last two years that like I am on the right path mm -hmm. with this mm -hmm. and that 
like while there are days where like I don't see a single order come through, like yeah. there are also days where I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> book a book book our book our vacation. Yeah, you know what right? saying? Yeah, you know what hey, where are we going? First class. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm committed to continuing to grow the business, scale yeah. it, and you know, hopefully get it to a space where we're entering in mass retail. And then while I know most people don't like to hear it, like I'm building for acquisition. Like I yeah. don't see this as like the Nothing last step. Who, who are so, acquisition targets? Is it, is it Procter & Gamble? Like, I mean, who? Whoever, whoever anybody. Pays the bill, right? <laughs> hey, True. Don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself. Saber construction. That's next company. Oh, man. Put a little money in there, you know? So essentially, um, here goes an in- interesting question. Um, a lot of people talk about wanting to be entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is like a sexy topic, mm-hmm. like especially TikTok, YouTube. Yeah, they're the you know new saying? rock stars. Yeah, like yeah. people are like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. Like, and every entrepreneur has a class on how to be an entrepreneur. I can't stand <laughs> yeah, right. that. Don't even get started on that. But um, so essentially, you are an entrepreneur who's still doing their nine to five job. Mm-hmm. So, what advice or why did you choose to stay down that route of like saying, hey, I'm going to keep my job and I'm going to start this business and go from there? And when would you suggest somebody to, um, if they were doing the same thing, when, when do you suggest to change or are you planning to transition just full time? Like, what does that look like from your thought process? Yeah. So a big part of the reason why I'm still working my nine to five is because many of the founders that I talk to who, you know, their products are on shelves, like their multi-million dollar brands at this point and continuing to grow, they all say the same thing. Mm. Hold on to your W-2. full-time job yeah. Get that as W-2. long as you can yeah, because it really income. allows you breathing space mm-hmm. to really be able to support the growth of your business without also thinking about how am I going to support myself. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. I know every two weeks my Mm-hmm. Check is going to be direct deposit <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. into my account, and so I don't have to think twice about like that aspect. And so it it gives me a bit more space to take risk yeah, yeah. and um, to go at different speeds because I'm not worried about like being able to right. you know take care of basic needs. So mm-hmm. um, I am holding on for as long as I can. Um, It is difficult. Um, Days are long, nights are long. But I think the other thing that's really beautiful about like the two spaces I'm playing in is that they're very complementary. So um, yeah, it doesn't feel like I'm in this space where like the two worlds are at odds. Um, I tell people all the time it's somewhat of a like anthropological experience because you know, things that I'm learning through my own experience as a small business owner, I use to inform improving my work mm-hmm. to support small business owners mm-hmm. and vice versa. That's a good answer for yeah. sure. So essentially everybody that thinks they need to stop doing what they're doing yeah. to start a company, you don't have to. No. No. You, you ain't going to make a million dollars in your first year. No, yeah. At all. You, know, and you don't want that stress either. No, you don't want that. Don't it's want it's that. much yeah. better as a side income at first and then maybe it'll I'm replace I'm prioritizing it, peace. Yeah, right? <laughs> no, really. Yeah, hey man, yeah. knowing that guarantee check coming every two weeks oh, is yeah. a little bit different than uh, and people. I feel like so many people. I don't know. There's this assumption that like when you're an entrepreneur and you're your own boss, that like it's just smooth sailing. But no. like it takes discipline, yeah, and for so sure. even with like working a nine to five, I know that like I only have a finite period of time outside of like my full-time work where I can like really yeah. like heads down yeah. um, do this work. So I've got to be super disciplined, disciplined and yeah. manage yeah. my time and be organized right. and be very like strategic about what I'm doing when I'm doing it. So yeah, for anyone who thinks that like you just can quit your job nah. and it's like sweet. Things are sweet out here. But you do have some, you have some experience from the bank. Like one yeah. thing I didn't, but I recently learned maybe like 2020 actually once i got that little grant money or little little, little ppp stuff you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah, right. but um it's like the w2 is more valued at the bank for loans dealing with money like getting things to start start with your stuff than it is like you having your you know this is how much i made like you could be banking in right you yeah. know what i'm saying but right. you're not you're not necessarily having that, the tax documents that verify that the bank is like okay i trust you Type situation yeah. with this type of money, yeah. so that you actually not, is a you benefit. Might want that tax yeah, you might not. The, the state also then like okay. I might be looking for a W two right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's different, and people. I don't think a lot of people don't understand. It's like it's different when you 
are your, you know, you're working for a company and they're bringing you all the business and you just have to work really hard to when you're your own boss. You got to work really hard for the business and you got to bring in business. Yeah. That's yeah. a little bit different of a mindset. That, 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 that piece is different. <laughs> oh, yeah. Prioritize piece. Oh, man. Yeah. So, so what does marketing look like for you? What are you doing from a marketing standpoint? Yeah. So it's some of everything. Yeah. Um, social media is like, it's its own little thing. Yeah. But um, we rely heavily on SEO, kind of word of mouth marketing. Um, our customers are like family. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who are shouting from the rooftops, like telling other people about the brand. Um, we're pretty active on Instagram, Facebook, just starting to lean into some other social media platforms. And so I've gotten to a space now where I'm like, okay, I need to hire someone to mm -hmm. help me with this because it's a lot to manage. So we work with an agency that supports us with like content creation Dope. and all of those things. Um, and I think the other thing that's been nice, so I've been kind of like the poster child for mm -hmm. accelerators. I've gone through quite a few of them in the last year, year and a half. And so there's a lot of press and coverage that comes out of those, yeah. which has been really nice as well. Like, you know, being able to leverage, you know, I, did Squares Accelerator and okay. Targets and Goldman Sachs, like, Dope. you know, that helps drive some legitimacy and helps to kind of um, position the brand really nicely. So a lot of people don't know what an accelerator program is. Can you just like a brief summary for the people who've never even heard of it? Yeah. So the easiest way to describe an accelerator, it's a program really focused on helping a business accelerate their growth in a finite period of time. So most accelerator programs involve a combination of like um, trainings and workshops, mentorship, and sometimes funding. Mm -hmm. And so with like Target Accelerator, it was all focused on learning like what it takes to enter into mass retail. So sitting down with Target buyers and their marketing team, like to understand like what your packaging needs to look like to even be feasible mm -hmm. as a brand to sit on shelf understanding, you know, financially, like if you're entering into wholesale, how you need to price your products. Um, with uh, the Square Accelerator I went through, it was really focused on the finances. So understanding like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're forecasting out for the next year, like, you know, what do you need to drive from a marketing standpoint to, you know, lead to the sales that you wanna see. So a combination of learning, mentorship, um, really fortunate to be able to sit down with like the CMO of Target yeah. and he have my products in his hands and yeah. say like this font's too small like this color would get washed away in the shelf like yeah. getting that feedback to support like the decisions that I'm making about the brand so yeah that's pretty solid yeah. um, so I did have another question as far as like um how do you apply for the accelerators? Is it open for anybody? Like, what do you have to do? If somebody was starting a business right now, they're sitting at home, and they're like, man, I wish I could get into these accelerator programs. Yeah. Uh, am I, are you just the, the queen of ex being able to get into <laughs> yeah, these? Yeah, that's how you've been about <laughs> So with accelerators, like, I mean, most of them are promoted pretty widely. You mm -hmm. go to whoever the hosting company or agency is. They usually will have the application and information about the program um, listed. What I caution people though is you have to ask yourself, is your business well positioned for accelerator? Most yeah. times accelerators are really focused on those high growth businesses, those that have opportunity to s scale. So, you know, if you have a cupcake business and mm -hmm your commitment is that they're going to be handmade till the end of time. Like yeah. that might not be well positioned for an accelerator that's really focused, like Target, getting yeah. products on shelves. Now, if you decide that you're going to have cupcakes that are packaged and you're going to manufacture them, you might be a good fit. So I tell people to just like read information about mm -hmm. the different programs, make sure that like you have an understanding of the business that they're looking for um, before spending your time applying because the applications can be extensive. They yeah. usually require like you to submit a video and write a couple of essays and your business plan and your canvas model yeah. and yeah. 
send in samples and all the things. And so before putting the time into doing that, just making sure you have an understanding of who they're looking for. That video is what gets me. I've tried to get an accelerator program before. I'm like, man, that, listen, I am not about to sit here and do the video. I, I give you all the information, <laughs> all the all docs, you, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But now the video, you're asking for a lot, you know Ask what I'm saying? too much. <laughs> So all the, after you've been granted all these awards, you've had all these different achievements, anything that stands out to you is that what you're most proud of so far with this journey? Ooh, that's a good question. I think what I'm most proud of is really just starting. Yeah. I think there's so many unknowns when it comes to entrepreneurship, and I'm very much a type A person. You all probably could sense that when yeah. I was like, do you all have questions yeah. that I can do? Yeah. 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 We definitely didn't have questions. Yeah. We didn't have questions until you asked that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm very much type mm -hmm. A, and so my risk tolerance you know, at one point in time was pretty minimal. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know... I'm just really proud of myself for taking mm -hmm. that step um, to do something that I didn't know where it was going to go. Um, every day, it's something different. Yeah. Um, Curveballs constantly being thrown my way. Um, but I think, you know, for aspiring entrepreneurs, um, folks who are kind of on the cusp of thinking, like, is this something that I want to do? Like, bet on yourself. Mm. I Like, you know yourself more than anyone, but I knew that I had something both in my mind and heart that I wanted to share with the world. And while there are many things that are still unknown to me, like, I'm just proud that I'm, yeah. like, betting on myself and believing yeah. that, like, I'm the person to do this and that I can. And you should be proud of that. That's awesome. I think a lot of people get stuck and just overthinking things when you just go out there and figure it out and let the market determine that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And we'll figure it out from there. But congratulations, commend, commend yourself for that. That's dope. Um, what is a sneak peek? We're about to close it up, but uh, what is a sneak peek? Can you give, can you give us a sneak peek? What's sneak next? Peek? Um, there's a lot that's coming up. Um, let's see. We have some new products coming out. So... We worked with a chemist to formulate some new products. So we launched with four SKUs in three different scent profiles. Um, we're soon to release a dish soap and laundry mm. powder. Um, so that's really exciting to just continue to grow the assortment of products that we have. Um, we were recently um, awarded a grant from Drew and Lauren Holiday Foundation. So um, some really exciting mm -hmm. press opportunities coming up and with them just getting the SB like really excited yeah. Yeah. to kind of ride that momentum. Um, what else? I mean, we're kind of running the slow and steady game um, or race. I, you know, I know where it's going, but I'm not rushing to get there because mm -hmm. I want to make sure that with the resources that I have, with like the capacity that I have, that I'm pouring it in the right places, making the right decisions. And granted, sometimes I <laughs> waste money, lose money, mm. make decisions that you know don't go the way that I expect them to, but just really committed to just continuing to build the brand, build the community around it, um, and see where it goes. Do you guys work with Amazon? Are you guys on Amazon or like no. how, so you just do just your straight right now, yeah. Direct okay. consumer. That's, yeah. that's what's up. Yeah. So you controlling yeah. the full thing right yeah. there. Yeah. Um, you know if you need an investment, you know. I was, I was Chase first investor. He didn't so invest in my company. It was first first. But he's one, tough. So once he invests in your company, you got questions every week. Listen, hey, listen, what's the, hey, I gotta know where my money's going. What's the financial statements look like? I don't <laughs> mind answering questions. I gotta know where my money's going. <laughs> you, know you know what I'm saying? But you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a, you know provide some growth. I I am a user of the company. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So it's uh we definitely got new customers so i'm definitely gonna uh you know definitely try the products out i haven't got any products yet. i should have got some for today alex yeah, you should have got some products you should have got some um note to self next yeah we should have been you should have the products yeah, on the thing on anyway <laughs> should have been marketing right here you gotta bring them in listen you drove all the way up here, here. You gotta, that's learning you know? it's all good next but, time um, next time so let everybody know where they can reach you at, what website they can go to to support the business, all those different types. Of, follow your journey. Yeah. Um, you know, you are a young black entrepreneur, woman entrepreneur. I think that that's a, a, a dope thing that people need to follow. So tell everybody where they can reach you at. Yeah. So products are available on our site, which is north24home.com. Um, you can find everything there. Um, one of the really cool elements of the brand is that we pair all of the products with cleaning playlists. So kind of going back to how mm -hmm. we grew up cleaning, yeah. like 
Saturday morning, That's cool. you know, yeah. old yeah. school music playing, everyone kind of uh, chipping in to clean. So that can all be found at the website. Um, we're on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, all the platforms at North 24 Home as well. And then my personal um, social is Toria Malia. Awesome. Okay. Perfect. You got any final questions before I jump into this rapid no, fire? Go ahead and go. You good? Yeah. Rapid fire. So rapid fire is just questions we just run off, and uh, you just tell us is this or that. You pick which one you prefer. Okay. All right. Ready. Here we go. Hotels or Airbnbs? Hotels. I'm the same. Listen to books or read books? Read. Go to the movies or watch Netflix? Netflix. Cable or stream? Streaming. IG stories or IG posts? Mm, stories. Watch the news or read the news? Can I ignore the news? <laughs> <laughs> you are the news. Like, you're I in the mean, news. <laughs> a lot of news has just lately been just so uh, overwhelming. Yeah, but sure. I guess watch the news. Okay. Would you rather start a podcast or write a book? Write a book. Okay. Apple or Android? Apple. Detroit pizza or New York pizza? New York. Okay. And if you were moving, if you were moving, mm -hmm. would you get friends to help you move or would you hire a moving company? A company. Ah, right, right, there you go. Right. There you Neither go. one person to well, say it. <laughs> Toria, we appreciate you jumping on. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, we're out. That's it. Yeah, thank you.